this the moment of truth when I try to uh, share the screen? Yeah, so it might be. <laughs> um, but I'll start things off. So um, first of all, a very warm welcome to Fire and Practice, Conversations with Wildfire Practitioners. So I'm Adriana Ford. I'm the Centre Manager of the Leaving Centre for Wildfires, Environment and Society and your host for today. So the Fire and Practice series brings to you speakers from across the world with the aim to explore the developments and challenges in the real world of landscape fire and also reflecting on the role and opportunities of research in addressing some of the issues. So the programme of speakers can be found on our website, though please note the dates uh, are subject to change. Um, and to keep updated on the programme and to register for our events, please follow us on Twitter uh, or keep an eye on our events section of our website. So I would like to give you a very, very warm welcome to our speaker today, Paul Hetley. So Paul is the Chief Fire Officer for the Northumberland Fire and Rescue Service, where he has served for 34 years, I think. Um, he held the interim chairmanship of the England and Wales Wildfire Forum from 2009 to 2010. And then in 2011, he established the National Fire Chiefs Council Wildfire Group, which he continues to lead, in order to raise the awareness of risks and dangers of wildfire incidents within the UK FRS community and to improve wildfire planning, prevention and response. He has also been involved in a number of other important developments for UK wildfire, including co-authoring the Scottish Government's Wildfire Operational Guidance, overseeing the development of the National Operational Guidance Wildfire Section, and leading the introduction of a National Wildfire Tactical Advisor capability in the UK. So before I pass on over to Paul, a little housekeep housekeeping. So firstly, please note that our webinar is being recorded, um, and as we've just said, that we will be sharing that afterwards. Secondly, we will have approximately 15 to 20 minutes for questions and discussions after the talk. So if you have a question during the talk, please pop it in the chat or save it until the end. Others can also like or thumbs up a particular question in the chat to promote it and then I'll try and find it. Um, or please use the raise hand option if you'd like to be unmuted to ask a question. And when you do, if you're able to turn on your camera, introduce yourself, especially if you're from an organisation, that would be great, although you don't have to. Thirdly, also please bear in mind how long you are talking for, just to make sure that others also have a chance to speak as well. And finally, if you need it, you can utilize the live captions feature of Teams by clicking on the three little dots at the top um, and clicking on turn on live captions. So without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Paul for his talk titled UK FRS Wildfire Preparedness and Response. Thank you, Paul. Perfect. Oh. Jumped there. Uh, for some reason, you know what was said. There we go. I think that's it. I think that's it. Um, thanks, Adriana, and uh, thanks to the Leverhulme Centre for the invitation to speak to you. Uh, to you all today. That was such a. That sounded like a great introduction. Uh, I just hope I can live up to the uh, to the billing. Um, what I am going to talk to uh, everyone about today is where the UK Fire and Rescue Services come from in terms of wildfire response, uh, preparation and planning. Uh, I do want to spend some time talking about the NFCC wildfire tackle advisor capability. And then I'm going to move on to what, um, what some of the current and future focus uh, will be. Uh, I hope by doing that, uh, I can identify areas which align with areas of uh, work or interest that you're all involved in and through that highlight opportunities which the NFCC wildfire group or some of those member fire and rescue services at a local level can step in and offer support to partners too. So uh, it's really a bit of an obvious slide to start with why UK fire and rescue services need to focus on wildfires. Um, in the most simple and basic terms, we need to focus on that because as fire and rescue services, we've got that statutory duty. Um, but as uh, I do like to quote Michelle Steenberg of the US National Fire Protection Association, and she's always very keen to uh, to use the wildfires are a great example of Riddle and Weber's wicked problem. Uh, and wicked problems are ones which we absolutely have to worry about. So wildfires, as well as the uh, issues which are on the slide, um, it's really hard to stop them happening. They're becoming more frequent, increasing in severity, becoming more disruptive. Uh, and I think it's probably, and I have put definitely, going to probably get worse before it gets better. They're multifaceted, very complex. Uh, they're very difficult to solve because of the incomplete and contradictory and changing requirements uh, that are often difficult to recognise. 
Uh, wildfires don't present a single solution uh, to the problem and no single agency can resolve them. So that in a nutshell is why it's so important for fire and rescue services across the UK to focus on wildfires and essentially just get better at preparing, planning and responding to them. And this is very much the, the core ethos of the NFCC wildfire group. Um, I'm aware that there are um, some fire and rescue service colleagues uh, on the on the call, but I think it, it's worth starting for those who aren't from a fire and rescue service background with um, what UK fire and rescue services class and define as a wildfire. And, and I think it's important to start uh, to start here because um, it's it's somewhat different to uh, to some of our partners in the wildfire sector. So for UK purposes, uh, any uncontrolled vegetation fire which requires a decision or action regarding suppression. Now that definition was developed as part of the drafting of the Scottish wildfire guidance. Um, we are back in 2012, it was published in 2013. And that came from um, a rewrite of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization definition of a wildland fire. Um, I was one of the authors of that guide but as time's gone on, I'm much less enthusiastic about using that as a definition as I feel it's just too ambiguous, if I'm being honest. Um, it doesn't feature in the Fire and Rescue Services Wildfire National Operational Guidance, um, but what is still consistent is the wildfire criteria, which was also introduced by the NFCC Wildfire Group to differentiate between lower risk, lower impact vegetation fires and wildfires. So where fire and rescue services need to define what a wildfire is, rather than those outdoor fires which have the potential to become a wildfire, these are the, the five criteria which we uh, use. So it involves a geographical area of over a hectare, has a sustained flame length of above 1.5 metres, uh, requires a committed resource of uh, four fire and rescue service appliances and, and by appliances we don't just necessarily mean fire engines there could be four by fours or fogging units uh, requires resources to be committed for uh, six or more hours and then there's as you would expect uh, a catch-all at the end which says, uh, presents a serious risk uh, threat to life environment property and infrastructure now any one or a combination of those is what the, the NFCC wildfire group and the tactical advisors uh, consider a wildfire to be. So that, that is the criteria which is currently applied within UK Fire and Rescue Service. Um, of, those, uh, of those bullets, only the first, third and fourth are recordable on the national IRS um, system, but two and five can be referenced on the national resilience reporting tool, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. And the reason why um, we, uh, the distinction is important for fire and rescue services is it allows us to determine the significance of that wildfire event across a broad range of measurable impacts. And that's the list which we've come up. So the geographical area, risk to personnel, service resilience, uh, resource implications, obviously the economic cost, which is quite difficult to establish, but uh, that there is some work coming from the Home Office on economic cost of fires, which I'm really hopeful will uh, will cover wildfire as, a, as an incident type as well. Um, importantly for fire and rescue services, that understanding of the impact on our business as usual, because uh, we do still have to respond to other incidents and deliver uh, our prevention and protection services as well and of course the impact on the broader uh, the broader community. So why I wanted to give that background and definition um, for the, the non um, fire and rescue services uh, attendees is because um, Forestry Commission utilised the Home Office Incident Recording System to produce um, their wildfire statistics for, uh, for England. So an assessment um, of the wildfire activity, um, in this case, I think this is the most recent uh, uh, publication over that eight year span from 2009, 10 to 16, 17. Uh, 
it's a really good document. Uh, I would encourage anybody to uh, to have a read of it. But clearly, what it talks about within that document is 260,000 wildfire incidents in England. Um, now, if you jump down to uh, to the third bullet, um, when we do the uh, alignment of those five FRS uh, criteria, which were developed by the National Fire Chiefs Council, that represents around about 7,100 uh, incidents, or only 2.75% of the total. So I think it, it's clear that um, what we we are distilling out is is the more impactful uh, wildfire events from those which are, in, as I've already said, have got the potential to be uh, a wildfire, but in many cases are just lower risk, lower impact, lower size. Uh, the bit on the bottom, the national reporting tool, um, we introduced the uh, recording of, of those five um, uh, wildfire criteria onto that in 2018, which accounts for the, the, the small numbers. We've tried really hard to get fire and rescue services to um, to make sure that any time they have an incident which meets any of those criteria, it's uploaded onto the national reporting tool. And I think what you can see, even given the, the, the limited um, population of it in 2018, is that we are clearly seeing an increasing uh, scale and frequency of larger wildfire events as the years uh, move on. So from 65 in 2018 up to the current, I'm, I'm not expecting this figure to uh, to increase in the next day uh, in the next week or so. Uh, 178 incidents uh, in 2021. Uh, one of the things which uh, which this does stimulate a little bit of debate on, and we have had this conversation with Forestry Commission colleagues, is that uh, there is a bit of a concern that um, the application of the Fire and Rescue Service criteria may lead to an underreporting of wildfire and just uh, an underestimation of the significance uh, and of scale and threat. But uh, we have discussed this within the uh, within the NFCC wildfire group and. Um, for the time being, at least, we still think it's appropriate uh, for the Fire and Rescue Service to uh, to adopt and use that uh, that cri set of criteria. So I just wanted to give a little bit of a potted history on some some key dates with regard to uh, development, and it, it might just be useful if to set the context of the journey that UK Fire and Rescue Services have been on over the last ten years. Um, as Adriana mentioned in, in her introduction, um, I and some other colleagues established the NFCC Welfare Group back in uh, August 2011. Now that was in response to the, the really very significant wildfire season we had in spring 2011. Um, that stretched fire and rescue services considerably and there were wildfires, significant wildfires burning from highlands and islands in the north down to Cornwall in the in the south. So it affected every every single area of the UK. Um, in a 19 day period from the 18th of April, there were 7,100 vegetation fires recorded, of which 251 of those were classed as being significant incidents. And of course, the most significant of those was the Swinley Forest uh, incident, which uh, which really put wildfire on the government consciousness and agenda um, and, and allowed us uh, with colleagues from across the wildfire sector to, to get into a few uh, discussions at, at a governmental level and, and open a few doors, which um, I wouldn't say they've been necessarily closed off uh, prior to that, but they the certainly um, they weren't on whale oil uh, door hinges. Um, so that, that was really, uh, in, a, in a perverse sort of way, quite quite helpful. So that 2011 uh, spring season just highlighted the need for us to change our thinking fundamentally on wildfire response, tactics, planning and prevention. And that was what the uh, wildfire group was set up to do. Some of the earliest um, outcomes from that uh, from that forum was the development of multi tier fire and rescue service training packages. Um, my own service, uh, Northumberland, uh, was heavily involved in, in that. Um, indeed, we've trained quite a number of uh, UK fire and rescue services. But together with, uh, with some other early adopters, uh, those training packages have been made available to services just to pick up and use and to, um, to ad ad 
adopt and adapt into a local context. So most services now, if they do have um, a well-constructed and a, a very well-embedded wildfire um, program, uh, are probably using something similar to that three-stage training approach, uh, which was adopted back in 2010-11. Um, I think what's been absolutely critical to the success of the developments that in the strides that we have made within the UK Fire and Rescue Service Centre is that uh, sector is that um, liaison and integration with international partners. So very early on, certainly when we were developing the um, the, the Scottish Wildfire Guidance, there was a lot of a lot of conversations and um, exchanges went on with colleagues in Spain, Portugal, France who were really uh, experiencing um, really damaging and significant wildfires. And we wanted to go to the people who had just the most experience, the best um, the best response mechanisms, the best planning and, um, and utilize that so that we could essentially just give ourselves a kickstart and get ahead of the game. So there was development of the, of the wildfire networks, which still continue today. Um, particularly with agencies such as Pau Costa, uh, the Graf Bombers in um, Spain, uh, the LARB, which is on the, uh, the the Mediterranean coast in southern France, and the GIF in Portugal, they continue and have been the the catalyst for uh, for another a number of other um, projects and collaborations right across Europe uh, and beyond. So I've mentioned the Scottish Wildfire Group, uh, uh, sorry, the Scottish Government Wildfire Guidance. Uh, it's freely available. The 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 link is is there if you want to uh, if you want to use it. Uh, I still think it's a really good document. It could probably do with with an update. Bearing in mind it's uh, it's coming up to uh, eight or nine years old, but uh, it certainly uh, it certainly was the the first time that the fire and rescue services in the UK had anything bespoke to. Um, align themselves to with regard to uh, to wildfire uh, advice and guidance prior to that we were still relying on a on a, on a book manual b um 6b uh, manual of firemanship um first published in 1946 and it's it's quite a it's quite a, a thick um thick manual but there were only really 28 pages uh, within it which covered anything which could be construed as wildfire-ish or forest firefighting-ish uh, or moorland firefighting-ish. Uh, so it, it really wasn't fit for purpose and it certainly wasn't fit for the new tactics and strategies that uh, that a modern fire and rescue service needed to uh, to adopt and implement to uh, to deal much more effectively with the, the increasing wildfire risk and threat. The next main jump was, um, uh, which did rely quite heavily on the Scottish guidance was the, the introduction of the National uh, Occupational Standard for Wildfire and the Wildfire National Occupational um, Guidance. That's still uh, extant. It's it's out there. I still think it's a good piece of work. It uh, It is due for a uh, refresh and review. Um, that's sadly been delayed by the, the COVID crisis, but um, it will be something which I think we'll be looking to um, move on as soon as, uh, as, as we're able. Um, there were a couple of uh, really good prevention um, outcomes uh, as well. There's a prevention toolkit which is hosted on uh, the Northumberland County Council website. But we also had some real success with their uh, colleagues in the uh, National Fire Protection Association and the International Association of Fire Chiefs in, in the US, uh, whereby we were, we were given um, permission as an NFCC group to take on wholesale all of the uh, the work they've done around firewise communities uh, and all of their other prevention programs. So they remain available to fire and rescue service to adapt. And we've obviously um, utilized some of those uh, in Dorset and, um, and Surrey uh, initially to put uh, firewise community uh, programs in place there where there was a specific wildfire risk and threat to, uh, to local uh, towns. Um, the last two parts on there are what I really want to talk around uh, in a couple of slides um, time, and that's th that's the last big iteration of the of the um, of the NFCC's uh, work program, 
the development of the wildfire attack yards has been a, a, a real success in my opinion. Um, it's based upon the principles which are um, enshrined in other concepts of operation within the, the National Resilience Programme for fire uh, and it mirrors some of the, the response uh, capabilities such as high volume pump, urban search and rescue which are available as fully supported, uh, funded and structured um, responses. So I if I just move on to the wildfire attack guard capability, uh, capability um, as I say, the development of that and the, 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 the planning for it started in late uh, 2016 and, and worked through 2017. And we first deployed it um, in uh, Saddleworth, uh, the Saddleworth Moor incident in July 2018. It was actually deployed uh, before the capability went uh, went formally live, and that came about as a direct discussion with the uh, the acting chief of Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, so the incident had been ongoing for a number of days, and um, I got in touch with the with the chief and just basically said, "Do you need some help? I think we've got some some people with." Uh, a really good skill set with the right sort of uh, understanding and knowledge and awareness of, of wildfire and I think that you'll find some real benefit in in getting a, um, a group of uh, the, the tactical advisors down to see you. Um, she took that uh, on board, got back to us a couple of days later and we deployed and it was a really successful um, deployment, I, I've got to be honest. Um, I suppose if, if anything can have a baptism, baptism of fire, if you'll pardon the expression, it was the wildfire attack ad, so the, that deployment to, to Saddleworth, that was a fire which burned for more than three weeks. You know, at its peak, there was 39 fire appliances there, 30 over the border appliances supporting Greater Manchester, uh, burned for 24 days. Um, and resulted in 300, uh, sorry, 34 homes being evacuated uh, with a direct cost to Greater Manchester of about 1.1, 1.2 million. Um, it didn't just stop there. Um, the, they rolled on. We rolled on that capability straight to Winter Hill in Lancashire as, as well, where again the move from one really significant incident to another. And Winter Hill, as I'm sure many people on the call uh, may be aware, uh, you know, that burned over uh, five square kilometres and at one stage was was seriously um, threatening some critical national infrastructure until uh, until the, the TACAD capability and uh, with support from South Wales colleagues uh, and their tactical burn team um, put some defensive burns in around that to protect it. So we got off to uh, uh, an interesting start, but it was a start which uh, I think just cemented and proved the concept uh, that we talked around for about 18 months prior to that. Uh, and it was really well received and it's allowed us to push on with a great deal of support from Fire and Rescue Services to enhance that capability. Um, we now have 45 uh, TAC advisors uh, led by um, Dave Swallow, who's just moved uh, from Greater Manchester to Hereford in Worcestershire uh, service. But that capability is a best endeavours. Although we sit within national resilience, it is a supported capability, not a funded uh, capability. So it is just um, to the um, to the uh, or through the support of the principal officers and the services, which uh, the 22 services which support it. Uh, that we're able to deploy it, and it's with the goodwill and, and grace of the the TACADs themselves that we we've still been able to respond to every single request for assistance that uh, that has come in uh, formally to the uh, to the centre. So the map the map there just gives an indication of where the um, the, the spread of uh, tactical advisors is. Uh, the green uh, the green areas were the initial uh, cadre, the uh, orange brown ones are the ones which you have come on uh, a little bit later through that journey. Um, as you can see, there's, there's a big gap of the east coast of England, which I would really like to be able to fill in due course with uh, with some additional sort of uh, geographically spaced strategic uh, strategic cover, and I'm sure that will uh, that will happen. Um, we try to continually professionalise the uh, the capabilities. So, um, Dave, together with uh, a number of other colleagues in in the TACAD group, have uh, have done a, 
a great job in developing CPD events, which by and large have been de delivered for us by South Wales Fire and Rescue Service. And they are really just aimed at not just embedding the, the skills and understanding and learning, but trying to take it on to uh, another level. And as I say, just continually trying to enhance the the provision and functionality that we can offer uh, to services if they if they need us. And just on the bottom there, in twenty, just as a as a little um, a little indication of uh, of the the use, thirty major wildfire incidents in twenty twenty and nineteen wildfire tactical advisors mobilised uh, to support that. Um, that's the concept of operations. I'm not intending to uh, to run through it. Uh, I don't mean it to be uh, an eye test for people on on the call. But this is really just, it outlines what fire and rescue services can really expect the tactical advisors to do for them when they arrived. It's been updated a couple of times in response to incident uh, debrief recommendations. So it is essentially a live document uh, and it does follow the format of the other concept of operations from other national resilience capabilities. But if you, if you can read the, uh, the text there, what should stand out is that uh, essentially, they are there to underpin the operational and tactical uh, plan in place by the incident command team and to do full 360 uh, recce to support that tactical plan and make a very quick assessment and uh, give advice on any immediate safety concerns or, or uh, issues which uh, which are identified uh, right from the from the off. Um, they would then move into a period of just getting into the battle rhythm and look to develop uh, that ongoing tactical plan with the incident command team and look to suggest suppression and defensive tactics to contain or suppress the, the incident and really try to give the incident commander and the ops commander a, a, a detailed understanding of what they can expect from the development of and progress of that fire over the, the next 12, uh, 24, 36 hours moving forward based on the weather, the fuel, the topography uh, of that uh, of that particular incident. Um, they work really well with their partners. Um, you know, let's be clear, wildfire is an incident type which absolutely needs um, more than one agency to, uh, to help successfully resolve it. Uh, and in many cases, uh, multiple agency um, uh, input. So again, the tactical advisors, because they have the, just that uh, greater understanding of of the landscape, the environment, and the um, and the um, uh, terrain, are probably really well placed to have some of those conversations with partner agencies uh, in lieu of the incident command team and the ops uh, ops commander. Um, moving just down to the to the last couple, just a couple of things that uh, I'd like to pick up there is if there are agencies who aren't in attendance at, uh, at a wildfire incident but the the wildfire tag ads think there is some real added value in getting them there that again is something which we would expect them to uh, to do and because one of the things which as a as a sector within within fire we're, we're, we're really keen to assist the development of a much more sophisticated and mature evidence base uh, on all things wildfire. One of the things that um, I have spoken to wildfire tactical advisors in the past about is just making themselves available if researchers or academics want to get sort of some very early um, early um, feet on the ground at a at an incident and just to support them in that and to try and just encourage them to to come along to gather that information and that evidence and that research which would go on to fundamentally underpin what we're looking to uh, what we're looking to do so in terms of being a good contact um that would be a, a good place to start uh, particularly if you happen to be in any of those 22 areas where the tag ads uh, are. Uh, that's a lovely photograph of Rob Stacey, who's one of my tag ads. Um, and what I, what I would say to this is, this is just a list, and I'm not going to read through it, but this is just what, given the length of time that the, the NFCC wildfire group and the tag ads have been in existence and the, the promotion that we've tried to bring to the, the fire and rescue service sector about wildfire awareness, 
planning, better prevention, better tactics. These are some of the things which we absolutely think should be at the forefront of most services' minds now. We can support them in that if they want some more detail, but generally speaking, these are things which um, all services should be, to a greater or lesser extent, already considering and working through. Um, some of the stuff on the bottom there, the burn suppression teams, the nighttime operations, uh, and that ability to confidently map uh, and mitigate fuel risk are things which, in my view, are really critical to uh, to improving the the successful outcomes that fire and rescue services can bring to uh, to wildfire incidents. So just moving on, um, manage the fuel, reduce the risk. That's a mantra you'll hear repeated uh, repeated often uh, within the fire and rescue service um, and also across the land management sector. And although that's some exact Excellent examples of fire and rescue services in the UK who are investing in wildfire specific vehicles and equipment. For the foreseeable future, it will continue to be a bit of a patchwork quilt of specialist and basic functionality. So, if I give an example of aerial firefighting assets, um, although often discussed, this is still something which is, uh, it's not something which is on anyone's agenda currently just to the, due to the high costs of providing a specialist and base work service, although some fire and rescue services can draw on other arrangements through partners uh, who may have aerial assets available to them. So the NFCC Wildfire Group and TAC ads advocate very strongly on the management of fuel to be the most effective way of reducing wildfire risk. Now, there's many ways to reduce wildfire risk. There is some controversy around prescribed burning. Um, all I would say as the NFCC lead is I'm a big advocate of, uh, of tactical burning and the, the ability to, to use burn as a, a suppression or a defensive tool, but it is a tool within our, 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 um, our toolbox. Uh, it's not the only way of managing fuel risk. And it's also really helpful to, uh, to ensure that um, in areas which have got significant remote rural or significant wildfire risk, that it's a great way of engaging with partners and land managers to develop those relationships and assist in the management of, uh, of fuel uh, before an incident occurs. So these are the questions which we would ask um, services. Do you know what the fuel risk is? Do you know where it is? Uh, do you know how it will change? And most importantly, can you reduce it and how? Uh, and that how is normally in association with other uh, partner agencies and land managers. So we've got a limited number of burn teams across the UK. Uh, we do have individuals who've got really um, highly defined burn skills, but in terms of application, um, I'm just looking at this from where we can put teams on the ground. So there's probably about five or six services who I would have confidence would be able to put a uh, burns team together and for that to be deployable either at the same time as the wildfire attack ads or as a bespoke, um, a bespoke um, bit, of, uh, bit of capability and functionality. I really want to grow that capability and I would like to get it to the point where there's about um, 10 or 12 teams across the UK with at least a minimum capability of eight or 10 people on that. So we've got some real resilience and we can bring that additional value to uh, services who may request that assistance. Um, there's significant benefits for fire and rescue services, uh, not least that it's low, it, it's, uh, low in reduction in maintenance costs, it's reduced resource, um, it improves firefighter safety, it's, it's fast and effective. And as I've mentioned previously, it does allow us to, uh, to assist in that fuel management and uh, risk reduction. Um, certainly proved the value at Winter Hill um, and in a couple of incidents which have happened in, in my uh, own service in Northumberland. But that capability development does come with some challenges. Uh, maintenance of skills and competence being one of them. The initial confidence of the, the, the burn teams to uh, to use fire on the landscape, um, how we can upskill very quickly, uh, given the vagaries of the, the UK weather. Um, in my case, in my service, we've uh, we've sent uh, staff abroad to, uh, to to work with international partners 
to get that um, really condensed and, uh, and accelerated training, probably on a scale which we couldn't replicate in the UK, if I'm being honest. Um, and then there's some other issues around just being able to secure suitable sites and obviously the new legislation which is uh, which is being brought in on prescribed burning. But at the end of this, what I've put on there in bold is this is a great opportunity in my view for fire and rescue services to, to support academic research and to really sort of assist with um, all of that um, really good and really valuable, whether it's looking at rate of spread, whether it's looking at fuel loading, whether it's looking at fire behaviour and, and fire analysis, it just gives us an opportunity to support that uh, that ongoing academic research. And again, I'll, I'll make that open offer to anybody on the line for me to, uh, to look to facilitate that. Um, I just want to touch on the uh, briefly on the recent deployment to Greece by UK Fire and Rescue Service. So this was the U the first UK Fire and Rescue Service operational welfare de uh, deployment. Although we have often been uh, asked to, uh, to to give consideration to it in, in the past, um, the the photo on there is uh, is the South Wales team who uh, who deployed, and some of you may recognise. Uh, uh, Craig there is quite a quite a regular attendee on uh, on webinars and, and dailings and uh, a huge advocate of, of, of fuel management. So that that's Craig there with his team. He's uh, second from the right. Um, the the deployment, if I'm being honest, uh, happened at Pierce. Um, it came from a, an offer of support to the Greek government by the Home Secretary, who happened to be across in Greece and, and saw firsthand the uh, the devastation that the wildfires were um, were, were causing. Um, and because of that, um, that pace and requirement to get out quickly, um, it was done under uh, an ISA uh, International Search and Rescue framework, uh, rather than anything which was uh, welfare specific through the NFCC. So teams from London, Merseyside, uh, Lancashire, West Mids and South Wales, plus the, the National High Volume Pump Capability Lead uh, deployed. But it was only really the, the the South Wales team who had what I would consider to be the the, the really detailed and in depth knowledge of wildfire uh, behaviour and wildfire firefighting. Uh, that said, it was really well uh, received and it was uh, it was successful. But as I've said on the slide, it wasn't optimum. So we are looking at ways of improving that offer for the next mobilisation. And we are pushing against an open door at the moment. So I think uh, I think government are very keen to have a UK deployable uh, capability uh, moving forward. It did receive some really high uh, media uh, interest. Um, uh, very positive coverage um, by and large. And there was a Sky News team embedded uh, which followed the UK deployment uh, on a daily basis. Uh, that's text I've put on the slide uh, on the side uh, really did cause some some concerns there um, bearing in mind we've got our first deployment we've got teams out there who aren't necessarily wildfire um, specifically trained or wildfire um, um, as aware of wildfire uh, as a as an incident type as, as the South Wales team so for people sitting back who are friends and family reading reading that tweet, I can just imagine the anxiety that it caused. Um, I got in touch with the team as soon as it was brought to my attention, and I was reassured immediately that nothing could have been further from the uh, from the truth. Um, yes, there was potential for some villages to be uh, surrounded and encircled, but all of the uh, all of the wildfire teams were were operating in a very safe environment, working from the black and as it turns out, quite a long way from where the real uh, the real focus of of the concern was. So, as I've said, we're working currently with uh, National Resilience, uh, International Search and Rescue, Home Office, and uh, Foreign and Commonwealth and Development uh, Agency to uh, on uh, future deployment models. We haven't established what those are, but you know, if we if we use the ISAR model, a rapid assessment, a light and a medium response would seem to be um, a potentially a sensible approach. Um, and it, but it will require some changes to our current uh, tag ad procedures and uh, and modelling. But very exciting and uh, something which I, I'm sure all of the tag ads uh, and services who've got a, a good wildfire. 
uh, capability would want to be part of if they can. So just moving on to the last couple of slides, I just wanted to, to, to finish off by talking through what we're doing now and what we would like to do. Um, so for the first few years of the NFCC wildfire group, active engagement with, with government was, I'll not be honest, uh, I'll, I'll be honest, it was a, it was a bit of a challenge, um, probably because it it isn't something which just sits in one particular ministry and it, it's, it sits across a broad spectrum of government. The lead ministry uh, responsibility currently sits with Home Office, but I'm not really convinced that's the best place for it to reside as it only sits with Home Office because Fire and Rescue Service sits with Home Office. So my personal view is it would be much better if it was DEFRA led because that just covers a much broader expanse of the sectors which are um, able to influence and um, and are impacted by wildfire uh, wildfire events. But for the time being, it's Home Office. Um, I've already talked about the, the, the TAC ads not being funded capability. That is work which uh, which is ongoing um, and has stalled a bit because of COVID, but it's definitely something for 2022 we're going to pick up to try and see if we can, if we can establish it on a, a much firmer footing and a much more um, sustainable footing. Um, there's some development ongoing of a, a wildfire framework for England. So unlike many countries in uh, in Europe, we do have a national wildfire strategy. Um, and this has been a, an issue which has been raised repeatedly by a number of uh, number of agencies uh, and has been discussed at the National Fire Chiefs Council Wildfire Group uh, on occasion. Um, but there is a, a framework which has been developed, which at least gives some uh, indication of what areas of wildfire policy uh, and delivery and prevention and response different parts and different agencies and different government uh, ministries uh, should have some responsibility for. So it's not a strategy, but it's certainly a, a good opportunity to try and just coordinate the uh, the, the working relationship uh, a little bit better between those uh, those partners. Um, the UK fire danger rating system is something which uh, which uh, myself and other NFCC members are involved in, and potentially this could be a real game changer for fire and rescue service. In much the same way that uh, when the flood forecasting centre started producing much more usable, definable um, flood mapping that certainly in Northumberland changed the way we prepare and respond to uh, to wide areas flood events. Now on the, the six key deliverables for the uh, for the fire danger rating project, if some of those things are um, fuel mapping, uh, rate of spread, fire behaviour, you know, all of that sort of um, functionality uh, is available accurately and consistency, consistently and to the right resolution. I think what you'll see is us being able to, to manipulate fire and rescue services preparations and response in a much more um, sophisticated way. So I'm really looking to the, uh, forward to the outcomes of, of those projects. Um, via South Wales, um, NFCC is, is, a, is a partner on the European AFAN project, which, which is Advanced Fire Analyst Network. Um, and this is allowing us to take advantage of the expertise across the EU and the technology that is already available to underpin um, fire analysis and fire behaviour uh, modelling. Uh, now this is this is a step which we are trying to move, and, it, and it's it's a space we're trying to move the the wildfire attack ads in into, and looking to develop uh, that ability to uh, to underpin um, wildfire analysis in a much more um, usable way for fire and rescue services, and similarly linked to that, um, one of the things which I've talked to um, a, a number of times. Um, with the, the the Northern Ireland NFCC uh, lead is uplifting their fire analyst cell, which they put in, in place remotely when they've got large uh, large incidents, particularly in the Mourne Mountains, to support that uh, on the ground response. Um, it works really well, uh, and I think it's something which could quite easily be adaptable to uh, to the rest of the UK. And um, finally, uh, the last few bullets. Um, 
that there's some work which is due to be published by University of Manchester soon on public per perceptions of wildfire risk. I'm really looking forward to seeing what that throws up because uh, I think just giving fire and rescue services and the NFCC a better understanding of what people think or don't think wildfire risk and threat means to them, that will allow us to shape and target prevention me messages much more effectively. Uh, and I just think that, that there's a space where we can work with uh, with academics on just some of that psychology around uh, public perception of, of wildfire incidents. Um, we're starting to work with partners across Northern Europe who are in a similar position as, as the UK regarding increasing wildfire threat. So taking the lessons which are, are being are already learned and uh, from from the southern mid regions um, and trying to get ahead of the game. Um, you know, the, the, the climate, the, the vegetation type is, is much more um, consistent across northern Europe. So we're, we're starting to try and broker those networks as well. Um, better understanding of health impacts um, on responders in the public. Um, as a chief fire officer, I want uh, I want all my staff to be to be safe when they respond to any incident. But obviously, uh, particularly with wildfires, given my uh, given my uh, lead role, um, but having that ability just to understand what the the, the scale and scope of that uh, potential threat is will be something which I think that there's already a number of people starting to look at and and getting some some real enthusiasm bef uh, about doing some research into. Uh, we were recently a consultee on the DEFRA project, which we're really keen to support. This was all around developing land management prescribed burn training and, and standards and qualifications. Now, that's something which uh, we were really happy to support as a, as a National Fire Chiefs Council because the more skilled people are doing this, the more uh, the more confidence we've got that they understand exactly what they're, what they're doing. And there's already some very, very skilled land managers out there uh, who undertake prescribed burning. But anything which improves that position um, obviously reduces the threat of an escape burn, which we've subsequently got to, got to attend. Um, and this is where we're going to have to lean into really heavily the, the you know, colleagues in, in climatology and uh, in academia about just our ability to better understand what the impacts of climate change and climate projections are going to be so we can start trying to model any future um, wildfire requirements for the, the UK Fire and Rescue Service. And just to finish off, just that whole better engagement with the research community, I think, is going to be key. And that's to allow us to um, understand, plan and prepare for wildfires more effectively, but also how we can support that uh, research more effectively as a, as a sector. And I think that is it. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, speak to you. I do. I, I am conscious that that was probably a bit of a, a bit of a gallop, but um, my contact details are there. I'm more than happy for anybody to get in touch with me offline or direct. Um, but I'm also equally as happy to uh, to take any questions, uh, any questions which uh, colleagues may have for me now. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, that was a really informative talk. Very, very interesting. Um, and I definitely would like to offer the audience a chance to ask some questions. Um, I'm going to try and switch over now to allowing uh, everyone to be able to unmute if they ask a question. But in the meantime, I thought we could just have a look at a couple of the comments back in the chat while I do that. Um, so I could see the first one um, was by actually a member of our centre, um, Matt, who was, it was when you were talking about the definition of wildfires in the UK. Um, and his question was, uh, what about peatland fires, which might be smouldering, but very significant in terms of area burnt? Um, these wouldn't necessarily meet the sustained uh, flame length requirement. So, do you want to respond? Uh, no, should I just uh, end this slide, sure? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, I, know, I know you talked yeah. about whether people wanted to go back to slides, but I'll no. just, um, uh, let's see. There we go. Uh, yeah, well, um, absolutely. But um, if if it was burning over over a wide area or it was burning for um, more than six hours, um, it would still be caught up within that within that criteria for, to be classed as a, as a wildfire. 
So it might not it might not have um, the the significant impact, but hopefully, the way we have constructed those those five criteria allows us to capture everything which we consider to be of significance. So even if even if it's uh, it's reasonably small scale, you know, I don't know, 100 square kilometers or 50 square kilometers, if it's burning for six hours and taking up a lot of resource, it's still something which is potentially quite impactful for fire and rescue services, depending on what other activity they've got on at the time. So um, the, that was one of the, the, the reasons we put the, the temporal aspect in as well, because we did appreciate, uh, and certainly given I'm the chief of Northumberland with with a, a, a very very significant well and uh, peat well and uh, risk, and um, that was one of the the, the reasons that criteria was uh, was applied. Thank you, Paul. So we wouldn't need to meet all of the criteria. It's just... No, it's one or yeah. a combination of of, of yeah. them. Um, just just to note, if you um, click on stop sharing, then we'll be able to see you. Oh, properly. sorry. Um, yeah. Is that uh, it? Has yeah. that worked? That's better. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let's have a look. Um, so people, feel free. You should be able to unmute yourselves now. So if you stick your hand up, I can try and look out for you in the um, in the audience there. But otherwise, we'll have a look at some of the other comments and questions. Um, <laughs> so Simon's not so much a question, but he just noted that the Home Office has published the wildfire framework for England today. So I'll uh, put a link in the uh, in the That's, chat. Yes. Yes, yeah. which is useful. Um, so one of the things you mentioned is about public perception. I think that's something quite interests me as well. So Adrian um, uh, Williston says, uh, Exmoor National Park is concerned about public perception about prescribed burning being a negative and damaging procedure rather than understanding the management for fuel loading. So yes, I suppose is that is that an issue that you've seen uh, quite widespread that public don't really understand what prescribed burning is actually for and uh, I think it depends. In my experience, it depends where those public are, are from. So if they, if they, in I'll use Northumberland as as a an example. I think if there are people who live in the countryside and, and are aware of why it's, you know, generally speaking, they've just got a better understand of why it's done and what it what it's done for. But quite clearly, um, we also have as a, as a tourist destination in Northumberland, um, we often get people who just see the there was burns taking place and think it is a, an incident or or a fire. Um, as I said earlier on, I'm I'm not wedded to any particular way of uh, of managing fuel risk as long as the fuel risk is managed. Um, so I, I, I am an advocate of prescribed burning being something which services can do in terms of defensive burns or um, suppression burns. Um, and I think we uh, we would always want to be able to utilise that if we were called of an incident. But if if fuel management is done using swipes, if it's done using robo cutters, if it's done using sheep, cows, you know, it, it's real. I'm really not that sort of um, bothered how it's done. The the important thing is that it, that it happens. And let's not forget in in the UK, you know, we don't really have any particular. Most of the land in in the UK is managed to some degree or or another. Um, it's just I think we just need to start getting a bit better at it and identifying the parts of the landscape which are really going to cause with problems if if a wildfire occurred, and and managing managing those areas as as well. Thanks, Paul. Which I think really answers the question at the bottom there as well. What are your thoughts on cutting as a fuel management team? technique instead of prescribed burning but i think you know that really captures it, 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 it if you can get it to it, uh, absolutely it's just clearly there's there's some areas where um the, the the fuel may be really problematic given either just the type of fuel it is or the fuel load and that it that it represents where you can't get um swipes or cutting uh cutting to it so uh, I, I think just having having an alternative way of managing that is uh, is essential. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. I see another one from um, Michael Bruce. Uh, where does fire and land policy rest in terms of legislation, policy and organisations in the UK? To what extent is this um, a UK issue or is it a devolved issue? Uh, you know what? I would have expected a really tough question off Michael and uh, sure enough, I've, I've gotten one. Um, well, 
I, I think the short answer to that is it, it, it's probably a devolved issue, if, if I'm being honest. But um, that's one of the reasons, uh, just to come back on my earlier comment about uh, the Home Office being England's lead uh, lead ministry for, for wildfire, I think it should sit with DEFRA because I think I think DEFRA is just a much more natural home because um, what we're looking at is we're looking at it through the wrong end of the telescope. We're, we're, we're using a, a lead government agency, which is is the, the the lead agency for a responder going to a wildfire incident. And yes, fire and rescue services have got a role to play in the prevention uh, element. Absolutely, we have. But I think. Um, Utilising the, uh, the the government um, the government ministries, which have the most the most influence and impact on land management policy, in my view, seems to be a more sensible place to uh, to to put it. Um, I, I'm not an expert on on Scotland, Northern Ireland, or uh, or, or Wales, Michael. Unfortunately, so um, I, I'm guessing that it, it it's probably um, devolved down to uh, to those administrations. He's probably Michael. You probably answer that better than I could, to be honest. I would, I would think. Michael, you're there, and you. Yeah, um, sorry, I, I just uh, just reaching for my unmute. Hi, Paul. I am. Uh, yeah, I, I I could have a go, but your answer's absolutely fine. It, it's it's a devolved issue. So yeah. in each of the, the the four nations, you have got the equivalent of Defra or something similar, um, on the environment side. And um, they are the ones in charge of legislation related to prescribed burning. So it's it's it's. I think you're right as well in saying that this is very much a multi-stakeholder issue, and that we won't find um, appropriate solutions unless we work together. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, just coming back to on, on the point which uh, which I, I, I tried to make during the um, during the presentation. Um, <laughs> One of the things we've been absolutely clear about in all of the uh, guidance that we've issued as a fire and rescue service sector is this is multi-stakeholder. We cannot, we cannot, we are not the the, the agency to address this uh, in isolation. Um, the the best response to wildfire is to address it before it happens, and that can only happen when we work hand in glove with uh, with partners right across all the the land management. Uh, land management sectors and we absolutely encourage fire and rescue services if they are not part of a, a local or regional uh, fire group uh, to get involved in those because that's where you start making the relationships and the networks which prove so um, valuable and crucial both in terms of the pre-planning but also if unfortunately you do have to uh, do have to respond. Thank you both. Um, I see another question just popped up um, by Ramesh um, Ningvaljam, and the question is, the Composite Burned Index, CBI, is a tool to assess the effects of fire severity on the ground developed in, I said the USDA, I don't know if it's meant to be USA or that's another thing. Well, um, will it be possible to collect this CBI sample from burnt sites in the UK too by researchers like us, so that he's a member of um, Leaving Wildfires, to finally compare with freely available satellite data to monitor from space? Um, I, I think this just comes back to the, the, the point I was making, which which was essentially an open off, uh, offer. Uh, Michael has just answered that. So I think the answer is uh, the answer is uh, quite clearly yes. But in, in terms of that offer, which which you know I'll be um, uh, I'll be cheeky and make on behalf of, of the sector, but I'm quite happy to coordinate. So if there are if there are well either wildfire incidents which uh, which researchers want to get to and they need some facilitation to uh, to have that uh, local contact, um, I'm happy to try and facilitate that and to, to particularly if it's if it's within an area which also has a wildfire uh, tactical advisor uh, who might be able to go and support. But similarly, um, I think we have talked about this previously, um, about just raising awareness of when services are doing, uh, if they're doing any burn training or anything like that, just making that um, offer and knowledge um, open to, uh, to to researchers if they want to come along to do it, to take any sort of detailed analysis and, and information. 
we're going to be the net beneficiaries of all of this academic research, you know, so it's in our best interest to try and be as supporting as, as we can. And that includes the, the conversation that we've had previously, Adriana, about um, um, for PhD students, if they want to, if they, if they want that opportunity to work with and embed themselves in fire and rescue services for any period of their um, of that, that, that PhD or, or postgrad work, um, again, I, I'm sure there would be fire and rescue services who would be absolutely delighted to, to offer that opportunity and have that resource at their, at their disposal to work with them. So again, I, I'm more than happy to try and sort of coordinate that as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that offer, Paul. Um, I think it's something that we really do want to, as a research community and in our centre specifically as well, to take uh, take up that offer and as a as a research community think about how we can perhaps coordinate that that opportunity to go out in the in the field when there is a, a fire, a wildfire, and um, how we can actually start making that happen. So the offer's there. It's about, I think, the next step is sort of coordinating that um, with interested parties. So perhaps it's a conversation we can have um further down the line <laughs> next year yeah yeah, yeah. I, I know it happens uh and I, I know it happens um obviously andy andy elliott who's one of the the national tag ads is is also a um a, an associate with exeter uh, university so I, I know he does um he he facilitates some of that down in the down in the southwest and the in the uh, along the south coast so it, it's just making sure that that opportunity to gather as much information in time critical situations is is there uh, and we can expedite it as effectively as as we we can brilliant thank you so much paul um we've finished with time now so i don't want to hold anyone up any longer um but just want to say thank you again so much for such an excellent presentation i know i personally really found it so informative i'm sure the others um on the call have as well so um thank you to paul and just to highlight our next um, talk is going to be on the 11th of January. Uh, it's rescheduled from October, so it's Dr. Mary Huffman from, she's the director of the Indigenous Peoples Burning Network and Fire Science in the Nature Conservancy. Uh, Conservancy. So that will be on the Tuesday <coughs> of January will be our next talk, so do come along to that one. Um, but thank you again, Paul, and thank you everyone who's joined us today. Um, hope to see you on future fire and practice uh, webinars so that we can all continue learning and uh, talking between the different sectors. Great, and I'll, I'll send you the, um, just in case I have updated the presentation since I sent you the one this morning, I'll send you the one I, I spoke to uh, Adriana and then uh, if you've got everybody's um, contact details, if they want it, I'm sure you can you can share it. That's great, thank you so much. Thanks, thanks Brilliant. again for the opportunity and um, have a fantastic Christmas everyone. Um, I'll not mention the fact that I'm on duty until next Monday, but uh, so I'll be having a very dry Christmas, but uh, all the best to everybody. I hope you have a lovely time. Thank you. Same to you, Paul. And yes, have a Cheers. great holidays and Christmas, everyone. And uh, yeah, see you soon, hopefully. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.